was invited to speak about what the Bank of England has sort of done wrong and what policies we can expect in the near future. And I'm going to do three things. First, I'm going to talk about the framework <coughs> of the Bank of England's policy, as I understand it. Second, what can be done about it? And third, what is the current situation and therefore the outlook uh, for next year? Um, I like to put on a lot of my presentations uh, this quotation which I found uh, relatively recently uh, from Milton Friedman, which says, monetary policy is not about interest rates. It is about the rate of growth of the quantity of money. Now, most of this morning, about the last session, you heard about interest rates. Interest rates are a symptom or a consequence of money growth. They can be used as a driver, but that's really to look at things through the wrong end of the telescope. Uh, some of what I will say will bear on that, uh, but I'm not going to be precise about it. I just wanted to explain why that quote is there. Um, if you read any of the quarterly reports of the Bank of England, they used to be called the Inflation Report, and they've recently rebranded re them as the Monetary Policy Report. Um, First of all, you have to go back to August 2018 to find any reference at all to money. So for four years now, they've never mentioned the quantity of money in their quarterly report. Second, there are always chapters on aggregate demand and aggregate supply. And this is very much the sort of framework of their thinking. Now, I, <clears throat> I'm not an insider, so I don't see the models that they use. And therefore, I'm going to use this as my um, basis for discussing what they do. So, that aggregate supply, and in this diagram you can find in any textbook, um, but it features in what the Bank of England is. It's the sort of underlying framework for their thinking. Aggregate supply is determined by things like labor force, the growth of the labor force, uh, immigration, the quality of the labor force, the le level of education and technical skills, and of course the growth of productivity. <clears throat> and the Bank of England sees, so that's the supply curve, and that the Bank of England sees its job as managing aggregate demand to be in line with aggregate supply and to, excuse me, to, to get the price level to adjust appropriately within the, or to meet the target, the 2% target. But the diagram and what they actually do in practice are miles apart. There are all kinds of practical problems. Um, if we just think about what happened in the, in the pandemic, Supply obviously fell sharply as the economy was shut down. And in that case, you would think you know, that they would seek to reduce aggregate demand. But no, they thought this was a disaster, so they needed to pump up aggregate demand. So we had rapid growth of money uh, rather than the reverse. Second, even if you can sort of relate these diagrammatic lines to the real world, there are huge problems which I indicated earlier this morning in a question and other speakers have mentioned also. There are huge questions about measuring output. The most frequently mentioned concept is the output gap. And here I've just done a diagram chart of the output gap measures from various different sources, the OECD, the IMF, uh, Oxford Economics, and the European Commission, measuring the output gap in the UK. And you can see there are wide divergences even between these four highly reputable institutions. 
Normally, output gap measures are done on an annual basis, so it's certainly not a device for steering monetary policy on a monthly or even quarterly basis. Um, and given this degree of divergence, um, you know, three, sometimes four or five percent between different agencies, um, it's very difficult to base policy on that. If we apply this across a number of different countries, the output gap difference between just two of them, the OECD and the IMF, applying to this to 2021 estimates of real GDP, potential real GDP, uh, sorry, it's, it's, the output gap is the difference between actual GDP and potential GDP. So these two institutions have divergences of 4.1% in the case of Greece, 2.3% in the case of the United States. I mean, that's a, that's a big one. That's important. But if the IMF and the OECD are 2.3% apart in their estimates, it's not a very reliable measure. And then at the other end of the scale, we've got Japan, 2.6% differential. Uh, the UK uh, was somewhere in the middle here at 1.2%. So it's even if you could operationalize those aggregate supply, aggregate demand curves, uh, they're not really very helpful. And the same goes for the Phillips curve. The Phillips curve is another way of viewing how close output is to full employment. Uh, and the notion is that if you somehow get to uh, full employment or if you get to um, full uh, output in the output gap concept, then at some point you're at, you're at risk of inflation. Quite exactly how inflation comes about in those circumstances is not clear to me. It's clear on a micro basis if you have access demand in a particular market, <clears throat> then the prices will go up. But relative prices are not absolute prices. The overall price index, in order to go up, we know that has to have excess, there has to be excess money in the system. And that's not what is implicit in this aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram, or in the output gap, or in the Phillips curve analysis. Now, suppose you've, you've sorted out what's going to happen with the output gap and the Phillips curve, and you've decided what your policy is going to be. Are you going to raise rates or lower rates? And I've got two little matrixes here that I've put together. As a central banker, you can make two mistakes. Um, you can, suppose the analysis says that you need to raise rates uh, so that the demand for loans falls, credit growth declines, and then money growth slows down. That, that would be the ideal outcome if, if the, the underlying analysis was correct. But quite a number of times we find that actually, despite the central bank raising rates, demand for loans remains strong, and market rates continue to rise, and money growth does not slow down. So you can raise rates, but it can have no effect if the underlying market force is still very, is very strong. That might well happen in an environment like the present, you know, where there's been strong money growth in recent past. Then you can make the opposite mistake. Uh, you can cut rates, uh, but the demand for loans could be very weak, the market interest rates falling, uh, and money growth not increasing. A classic example of this is what happened when Japan's bubble burst. When Japan's bubble burst, the Bank of Japan cut rates, but very slowly it kind of followed the market down. And the result was that money growth went from 12% year on year, broad money growth, from 12% down to zero. It actually went negative. So it was clear that they were not cutting rates rapidly enough. So you know, even if you can get the, up, the supply, aggregate supply, aggregate demand analysis right, the output gap right, the Phillips curve right, you, know, you can still make mistakes with interest rates. And even then, as I said at the beginning, interest rates are not a reliable tool because the fundamental problem, as I see it, is this. That if you increase the money supply rapidly for a sustained period of time, like 
a year or two years. The first effect will be interest rates fall. This is what we saw at the onset of COVID, roughly between March of 2020 and August or September of the same year, interest rates were falling and remained very, very low. And that's when everybody talked about a long period of deflation and high unemployment and so on. But a few months later, the economy started to, the economy started to recover, demand for credit rose, inflation expectations started to build, and interest rates started to rise. In other words, the first effect of rapid money growth was that interest rates fell. The second effect, and it's usually the more dominant effect, is that interest rates rise. And this is directly contrary to what Tim was talking about earlier today when he mentioned the downward sl sloping liquidity preference function. That curve of Keynes says that when you increase the money supply, interest rates decline. Yes, they do for a very short time, but then they rise. And that is not taken into account in many of these central bank um, exercises. If we include some actual examples, good, some good examples of the Fed tightening but not having really any effect. When 1965, 1984, and another example is uh, the, this one down at the bottom. Uh, the start of the GFC, uh, when interest rates were reduced sharply to zero, uh, but in spite of that, the UK money supply collapsed. So, Bank of England was lowering <coughs> rates, but it didn't really produce easy money. And the result was we had a very painful period between 2008 and 2011-12. So, uh, even if you can get those things right, it, it's difficult to conduct monetary policy in this way. So, and I, I've got in my paper, and I'm not going to spend time on it, but I've analyzed various periods when monetary growth in the UK really went wrong. Now, this chart simply shows you nominal GDP in red and broad money growth in black. Um, generally, when you do this chart, when you do these kind of numbers, what you find is that money growth grows faster than nominal GDP. And that's because of what Juan Castaneda was talking about this morning, that there's a trend decline in velocity. People tend to hold more velocity. So the one or two percentage points average difference between these two is due to the change uh, in money holdings. But the point of the chart here is that there were periods when the Bank of England, in my opinion, clearly failed to get the interest rate movement right. And the result was, in these cases, that we had unusually low uh, money growth, uh, in, actually in all those episodes. Um, and um, so th this is bearing out that, that same thesis. As Juan said, um, velocity, the relation of Spending to money or money to spending is very is, is generally pretty stable. Uh, for the UK, the chart on the left is M4 velocity. The chart on the right is M4x, and we only have data for that from the 1990s, 1998. But the question is, can we use that stability in velocity to construct an alternative form of monetary policy? And I believe you can. And again, I'm not going to go into the detail, but if you adjust money growth, let me, let me say it a different way. If you have a certain rate of money growth, then money growth will be absorbed by three things. First, there is the increase in money holdings. That's the V and the MV equals PY equation. Second, there is real GDP, which has got to be financed. And anything left over, any residual, is going to be inflation. So, what I go through here is an exercise in reducing money growth, um, allowing for these different things. First, first for money, uh, for real GDP. Uh, second, for um, velocity. And third, uh, for inflation. 
And what you should end up with is a rate of growth of money which is virtually zero um, when these adjustments are made. Um, and you can see that in the period up to the GFC, money growth was generally too rapid. Um, and in the period subsequent to the GFC, money growth has been much lower. And as a result, the, the period between 2010 and 2019, at least, there was a period when inflation targets were generally met again, although they were slightly on the low side. So we now move from, so I, th I think you can use that framework. I don't have time to go into the details of it. But what I would like to do is to talk about what's happened and where we go from here. So during the COVID crisis, the bank created money at a rapid rate. I think what they thought was, we did QE after the GFC, and it didn't produce inflation. Now, we've got another crisis. We'll do QE again, and it won't produce inflation, and we'll be able to restore um, economic activity quickly. And if you measure how much money has grown from the start of COVID to the present, uh, the amount is uh, sorry, 540 billion pounds. That's how much M4X has grown. And where has that come from? Most of it has come from the Bank of England's purchases of assets, plus a bit of lending that they did. Um, in fact, uh, 470 billion out of that 540 billion is accounted for by the Bank of England. And in addition, um, the banks created nearly 200 billion through, through lending. Uh, there were some other things going on on the balance sheets of banks, which had a net negative effect, but the, basically you can see that money creation during this two and a half year period has been dominated by what the Bank of England did. And the uh, question going forward is, you know, what's going to happen? What are they going to do? One way to look at that uh, is with this chart, um, is what I call the, the JAWS chart. Uh, the black line here is, is money. Uh, the red line is nominal GDP. Uh, we have slightly different scales on each side, but designed to line up these two. So the, you can see there was a good relationship between money and nominal GDP prior to COVID. When COVID happens, nominal GDP and real GDP slump, but the Bank of England turns on the afterburners and money growth surges. So now I ask you, as good students of monetary economics, how is this gap going to close? Is it going to close through money coming back down to nominal GDP, or is it going to close through nominal GDP rising to close the gap with money? I won't ask you, because I think you all know the answer. The only way it's going to close is for nominal GDP to close that gap. I can't remember whether I've animated. Yes, if we make this assumption that money growth slows, and that that gap is closed by the end of 2024, and then we measure the rate of growth of this line, it's about 8% per annum. Of course, you can make other assumptions. You can say that this convergence won't occur until 2025 or 2026. But whatever you say, you're going to come up with some number like 5, 6, 7%, 8%. And we know that the British economy can only grow at about 1.5% per annum. So the rest is going to be inflation. So I'm reinforcing what Tim said earlier this morning, that the inflation is going to be persistent and continue not only through, through this year, but through 2023 and probably into 2024 as well. Okay. Now you've had various different presentations of the process. I want to give you yet another one um, uh, on MV equals PY. Uh, here I've done basically what Juan did in a simpler way. We've got the rate of change of money in a year, the rate of change of velocity, the rate of change of real income, and the rate of change of price. And then these are annual figures. Uh, everything in black is real data. That's actually happened. Everything in red is, is a forecast. 
But basically, you can see that in 2020, we had a big surge in money growth. Initially, velocity fell sharply. In other words, money holdings increased sharply. Real GDP collapsed, and prices jumped a bit. That's, that's one of a, a GDP deflator measure. Excuse me. Um, the next year, we had lower growth of money. Uh, of, uh, money holdings... Uh, Output recovered and uh, inflation was very, very low. This year, uh, money growth has been much lower. Uh, money holdings are picking up. This, that's this return to, to trend that Juan talked about earlier. And uh, output has been negligible, but inflation has picked up sharply. But what, I, what I'm trying to picture for you here is it's like a, sometimes people talk about um, a rat uh, being swallowed by a snake. And you can see the snake's belly expanding as it moves through. And essentially what's happened, the bit in, that's year one in pink, and then it flows through to real incomes in year in the second year, and then to prices in the third year. And then the, the yellow, again, but it, the, t the inflation tail lasts longer because we've had such a big surge of, of money growth. Um, so what's going to happen going forward? We know we're going to have inflation. I'm sorry. We know we're going to have inflation, but we, they're also going to do QT. The Bank of England has announced that, that, that it will reduce its balance sheet by 80 billion pounds. I think their analysis behind this is deeply flawed. They think that Q, QE and QT are asymmetric. They could do QE in a crisis and it's very helpful. They, they think they can do QT and it won't have any effect. But if you go through the balance sheets, if they dispose of government securities, the treasury deposits go down, the treasury has to issue more debt. That means the public has to buy that debt. That in turn means that uh, the deposits of the public decline uh, in order to compensate or to, to, to pay the treasury. Uh, and the result is net-net uh, at the end of the day that, well, excuse me, that um, you will only get an increase in the money supply. I'm sorry I have to do this so quickly. You will only get an increase in the money supply if loans increase enough to compensate or the decline in government securities by the bank. So I think that since interest rates are a lot higher, the economy is going to be a lot weaker, demand for loans is likely to be a lot weaker. I think that uh, this QT that the Bank of England is embarking on is potentially highly dangerous and highly risky. So to sum up, uh, the QE unwinding QE was needed after the debt crisis of 2008-09 because the banks weren't creating money. The central bank needed to step in and do it. Um, reversal of that, the reversal of that is that QT will gradually force a reduction in the money supply. And if the banks aren't lending or if their lending is reduced, then we will have a, a sharp, we'll have a decline in the money supply, and that will be very dangerous. So to prevent a decline in the money supply, uh, it's necessary that banks create enough new deposits or credit, uh, sorry, enough new credit to create the deposits uh, that will offset what the Bank of England is doing. So to conclude, um, excessive money creation was behind the inflation. There is an alternative way to operate policy using that stability of velocity. I wasn't able to explain it in detail in this presentation, but I think it can be done. Uh, and finally, uh, we've got a problem coming up because having created too much money, it now looks as, the bank, as if the Bank of England is going to make the opposite mistake. Having put their foot hard on the accelerator, they're now slamming their foot on the brake. And we're likely to have a more intensified recession than we need.